What motivates you? What makes you get out of bed in the morning and say, I am going to accomplish this goal or I am going to take one more step closer to accomplishing it? Are you somebody who wants to learn a musical instrument? Are you somebody who thrives when playing sports? Are you somebody who simply wants to achieve a goal that will have lifelong implications like getting a college degree? Motivation is a need or a desire that directs one's behaviors to do specific things. So think about what motivates you. Motivation is a hypothetical concept. We infer motivation from the behaviors that we observe in our world and then we model it. We go and try to, you know, accomplish something ourselves, like taking our first steps. I remember when my daughter was a little girl, she saw another baby in a room that was just learning how to walk and my daughter was not there yet. However, when she saw that girl put her arms up in the air for balance and start to toddle around the room, I could see the motivation building in my little tiny girl. Soon enough, within a week, she was toddling around the room as well. She saw the goal and she sought to accomplish it. Now, in terms of the animal kingdom, they have this internal unlearned behavior that is known as an instinct. That is their kind of natural tendency to make something happen, like the return of the salmon, when they go up the river so that they can spawn, or imprinting in birds. It is this natural inborn drive that they have in them. Now, sociologists tried to name human instincts, but they were not able to explain them. Now, think to yourself, though, how can instinct be linked to motivation? Because with humans, we tend to focus on drives and incentives. Now, there is something known as the drive reduction theory. This idea states that there is a physiological need that creates this aroused tension or a drive within us. And this drive then motivates an organism or a human to go and satisfy the need. When the need increases, then the drive increases because our body seeks homeostasis or the maintenance of this generally steady internal state. For example, your body tends to like to stay at the same temperature. So if you're out in the freezing cold, there's gonna be a drive to get a jacket, hats, and mittens. Or if you're in the extreme heat, to probably get a lot of water and maybe something to help you get out of the sun if that's the reason that you're hot. So we have these drives and incentives and we want to go and reduce them when need be. Another example is hunger. Now there have been different studies like the Minnesota starvation study and others that have looked at what people do when they are not getting enough food. And these studies have concluded that people become obsessed with food when they're not getting enough. Now this has been seen in Holocaust testimonies, but it also was seen in that study conducted with 36 participants who were given a very low calorie diet and they became fixated on food, talking about food, thinking about food, because their body was wanting to reduce the drive to eat. Now, our body chemistry does impact our hunger. The body keeps track of its available resources, and so when the blood glucose levels drops, our hunger increases. Now, there are areas within our brain that do control hunger. One is the hypothalamus. Now, they have done studies with rats to see if, for example, they can go and stimulate the hypothalamus, would a rat still be hungry? And what they found is if they continue to stimulate the hypothalamus, then the rat no longer feels hunger. And unfortunately, with the study when they have given the rats the ability to go and, well, press their own button to go and get kind of that hypothalamus buzz, well, the rats kind of pressed it so much that some of them starved to death. So, of course, that is never good. What else 
allows us to know that we're hungry, besides the hypothalamus. Well, psychologists took amnesic patients and gave them a lunch. They then went and waited until they were done, waited an additional 20 minutes after they had finished, and they came back in again with food to see would they eat the food or would they recognize that they are full. Well, surprise, surprise, the people ate the food again. So they did it again 20 minutes after they had finished, and the people again attempted to eat the food. Now, what is this? Why were they still eating even though they had just eaten 20 minutes prior and then also a short time before that? When insulin levels go up even when we see or smell food, and that triggers a whole body reaction to get ready to eat. And so the people had the insulin start to go through their system when they smell and saw the food and so well yeah they started to feel a little bit of hunger and went to go try to eat now when we think about motivation of course we think about those big goals like being a concert violinist and practicing for hours and hours and hours but what motivates us on a daily basis what motivates you to get an education does our brain dictate more than we're actually aware of? Is it going out and telling us to go do this or go do that? What about things like addictions? What motivates people to stop it? Or what motivates people to keep them up? These are huge questions within psychology that psychologists have conducted numerous studies to try to find the answers. Now, there is something known as achievement motivation. This is a desire for a significant accomplishment, for a mastery of things, people, or ideas, for attaining something that would be seen as a high standard, like my example of being a concert violinist. Now, you may be able to know somebody who tries to achieve at everything, but what about the people that focus on just one item to get really good about it too? They are demonstrating a high achievement motivation. Now, in terms of highly motivated kids, they tend to often have parents and teachers who encourage independence at a young age so that they go out and seek their own goals and seek what they actually are passionate about. Now, these parents and teachers usually also offer praise and reward their successes within limits. We'll talk about that in a future lecture. They also learn to associate achievement with positive emotions. The kids are generally happy when they go and make steps that lead to them achieving their goal. Studies have shown that people who have high achievement motivation do actually achieve more in life. There's actually a study in California that followed 1,528 children from school all the way up into their 40s, and they really showed that that high achievement motivation matters in life. So, what, what and how? Well, high achievement motivation usually means that somebody is more disciplined. For example, top violinists have practiced some 10,000 lifetime hours. That is double the practice of somebody who wants to just be a violin teacher. People with high achievement motivation have a willingness to persevere, and they simply have the grit to keep with it. Now, they also most likely have a pretty high level of intrinsic motivation. Now, what's the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation? Well, intrinsic motivation is this desire to perform a behavior simply because you like to do it. It's for its own sake or simply so that you can be effective. Intrinsic motivation leads to a personal enjoyment. It's something that you are interested in or it's something that you really find challenging and really want to achieve the goal associated with that challenge. Extrinsic motivation is a desire to perform a behavior due to some sort of reward or possibly because there is a threat of a punishment. So if you are worried about a test grade and you're studying because of that, that's extrinsic motivation. If you wanna be that world-class violinist, that's intrinsic motivation. Now think of some other examples of the two. 
Now, there have also been interesting studies involving motivation. Football players that are on scholarships tend to feel more pressure and have less fun playing the game than those who are actually paying for college. Why is this? Well, they have a lot of pressure. They have to keep up their grades. They have to keep up their skills on the field and have to accomplish what they need to or else they lose their scholarship and they lose college. So this is huge. Now, intrinsic motivation has been seen to have more positive results over time and extrinsic motivation according to various studies. Now, that does not mean that extrinsic motivation is bad. Of course, <clears throat> being told to go and clean the dishes and getting threatened that you're gonna, you know, not be able to go out with your friends if you don't accomplish that, that's really good because it helps the family to go and clean the dishes. And well, it helps you next time you wanna have a bowl for some cereal, then you have a clean bowl. So that form of extrinsic motivation is very helpful. The intrinsic motivation is also very wonderful for accomplishing goals like going to college, seeking out a certain degree and going through all the steps to do that. Now, extrinsic motivation has been seen to wane over time, which can be an issue. For example, when I was a kid, my mom used to treat me to ice cream after every single piano lesson, but then she randomly stopped one day. Shortly after that, I also stopped going to buy piano lessons. I originally really wanted to learn piano, but then my mom kept giving me ice cream, giving me ice cream, and soon I started to get really focused on the ice cream, especially going to the ice cream shop. That was really big. And over time when, well, the ice cream stopped, I lost a certain level of my motivation for piano. Also, you know, all those hours of practice, for some reason as a 10 year old, I wasn't really motivated to go and put in all of those hours on a hot summer day. So evidence suggests that removing the extrinsic motivator, motivator will result in lower levels of motivation than before the reward existed at all. Now the over justification effect states that if we are given extrinsic rewards for items that we already love, then the intrinsic motivation will decrease and be replaced by extrinsic motivation. In other words, when I don't get the ice cream cone anymore, I don't wanna go to piano lessons. So this has been a short lecture going over motivation within psychology. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. And thank you very much for listening. Bye-bye.